Okay, can everybody see the slides and hear me and everything? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so as, as Camille said, I'm gonna talk about a project that I did for my PhD thesis in which we used a KMER based method to identify germline restricted chromosomes in these fungus gnats. Yeah, so first, uh, so this is a project I did in Laura Ross's lab and uh, also Camille helped with uh, this project quite a bit. So if you have any questions about this, you can ask either me or him uh, afterwards. So um, germline restricted chromosomes are part of this sort of larger uh, phenomenon known as program DNA elimination. So basically what happens in species with program DNA elimination is that they um, eliminate either portions of the genome or entire chromosomes from somatic cells early in development. And so this results in some portions of the genome uh, being restricted to the germ cells uh, throughout most of the organism's life. And this actually has evolved in quite a few different uh, lineages. So in this phylogeny, all the lineages in red have programmed DNA elimination. Uh, and germline restricted chromosomes are sort of a subset of this phenomenon in which uh, like entire chromosomes are eliminated from somatic cells early in development. Uh, and so I've shown some pictures of a few lineages that have germline restricted chromosomes. And these chromosomes are interested, interesting for a number of reasons. So they often exhibit different transmission patterns to the rest of the genome. And specifically, they often have sex bias transmission because they're only found in germ cells uh, throughout most of development. They're expected to evolve some sort of germline specialization over time. And also the origins of these chromosomes are generally fairly poorly understood. So there's some idea that they might have evolved from B chromosomes. So chromosomes that are sort of not necessary, but present in some individuals, but not others in populations. Or they might have also evolved from uh, chromosome duplications from uh, other chromosomes in the genome. But there's, for most of the lineages, with the exception sort of, of songbirds were learning more about the origins of uh, germline restricted chromosomes. But for the most part, we really don't know very much about the evolution of these chromosomes. So this is sort of especially true in flies. So there's actually three different fly uh, families that have germline restricted chromosomes. And two of these families, the Sieridae and the Cecidomidae are fairly closely related to each other. So they're both uh, gnats. And so you can see in this phylogeny that although these two families are sort of in the same clade. They're not actually uh, sister clades to each other. They're, so there's some um, uncertainty about how the germline restricted chromosomes evolved in these two different lineages and whether they share a common origin or whether they've evolved independently in the two different families. And also there's really not been any work sort of done trying to characterize the germline restricted chromosomes in either of these clades. So that's sort of what I was focused on, uh, looking at the evolution of the germline restricted chromosomes in this uh, Sieridae species, Bredesia coprophila. So first I thought I'd just show an overview of the types of chromosomes and their expected sizes. Uh, so there's three autosomes in this species. There's the X chromosome, which is shown in blue in this figure. And then there's also the germline restricted chromosomes, which are shown in orange. And the genome of the species is expected to be around 360 megabases. Um, and then I've also sort of shown the relative sizes of each of the different types of chromosomes uh, that are, so, so the, rel the expected sizes are based on flow cytometry estimates. So I think, so another thing I'm just gonna mention about uh, fungus gnats before we go on is the genetic system of these flies is pretty uh, unusual in a, a few different ways. So there's a lot of unusual chromosome elimination events that happen in the development of these flies. So first of all, so this figure is showing sort of a schematic of the number and types of chromosomes uh, in males and females sort of over development. And so first of all, an important thing to note is this species has an XO sex determination system. Uh, but the way this happens is a bit unusual. So all individuals start with three X chromosomes. And then early on in development, uh, either one or two of these chromosomes are eliminated just from somatic cells. And that's what causes females to have two X chromosomes uh, in somatic cells and males to have one X chromosome. And then the germline restricted chromosomes have sort of a similar elimination event early in development in which all of them 
all the germline restricted chromosomes present are eliminated from the somatic cells early in development. And I've just shown a picture of this happening at the bottom of this slide. And then additionally, um, one germline restricted chromosome is eliminated from germ cells early in development. So individuals start with three of these chromosomes and then uh, one is eliminated. So adults of both sexes have two GRCs in their germ cells. And then these chromosomes also have unusual transmission patterns. So uh, meiosis happens in sort of an unusual way in fungus gnats because they have this system of reproduction known as paternal genome elimination, which I'm not really gonna talk about, but what uh, sort of that means for the germline restricted chromosome transmission is that in males, there's no recombination and all of the GRCs that are present in germ cells are transmitted to offspring through sperm. Whereas in females, meiosis is pretty normal uh, and the GRCs are expected to recombine in female meiosis. And then one is transmitted to offspring through eggs. So I've already mentioned most of this, but I thought I'd just summarize some of the reasons that we're interested in the evolution of the GRCs in these fungus nets. So this is, one, this is an independent origin of GRCs that hasn't really been studied yet. And it's also kind of unclear how the um, system of reproduction that this species has fits in with the evolution of GRCs uh, sort of overall. Uh, also, these chromosomes have sex bias transmission and germline restriction. And so we're interested in how these two factors affect their evolution. And then lastly, we really just don't have very much idea about how, about the origin of these chromosomes. So we're sort of just generally interested in that as well. But in order to sort of answer any of these questions, we uh, first needed to be able to sequence the germline restricted chromosomes. So to do this, we made use of the fact that uh, there's actually um, different numbers of different types of chromosomes in different tissue types in males. So uh, you can see in both the table and this figure that um, in somatic, so in heads versus, versus in germ tissue, so specifically uh, in sperm and testes, there's a different number of autosomes in these two tissue types, a different number of X chromosomes, and also the germline restricted chromosomes are only present in sperm. And so we can use the fact that there's a difference in the different uh, chromosome type, the numbers of the different chromosome types to identify um, what scaffolds belong to which chromosome type in a genome assembly. So we ended up doing this mostly with Illumina sequence data, um, although we collected also some patent bio data, um, but I'm not really gonna talk that much about that today. Uh, so we ended up using the Illumina data mostly because the genome assembly that we made with this data had a, a better BUSCO score. So it seemed to be sort of generally a better assembly. And basically what um, I did was I dissected out heads uh, and then testes of the same males. And so we had 95 males uh, in our sequencing pool in total. And then we sequenced these two tissue types separately and generated a genome assembly with uh, both of the, the sequence from both tissue types. And then we used two different methods to identify what chromosome type scaffolds belong to. So we used the camer based method and also a method that used coverage differences. So for the coverage method, basically what we did was we mapped the Illumina reads back to our genome assembly, and then we compared the coverage um, in the germ versus the so somatic uh, sequencing library for each scaffold. So that's what this histogram is showing. Um, and so what you can see is that based on the differences, the expected differences in chromosome number in these two tissue types, we can sort of identify what scaffolds belong to the autosomes because they have a, a higher coverage in the somatic tissue versus scaffolds that belong to the X chromosome versus scaffolds that are sort of only present in the germ tissue library. And so those are expected to belong to the germline restricted chromosomes. And another thing that you can see uh, from where the placement of the peaks of these histograms is that although we had sort of an expected coverage difference for each chromosome type, uh, when you made this germ versus soma coverage comparison, the actual coverage difference was a bit uh, less than we expected it to be. And so the reason for this is probably that there is some somatic con contamination of the germ tissue sample, which really isn't that unexpected, I guess, given that we had to dissect the, the testes out of these individuals. So you would expect there to be some sort of uh, some somatic contamination associated with that. <laughs> 
but regardless, um, with this method, we were able to separate most of the genome as belonging to either the autosomes, the X chromosomes, or the germline restricted chromosomes. And then the second technique we used um, to identify what chromosome scaffolds belong to was a Kamer based technique. Uh, and so I guess you'll hear more about separating chromosomes based on different frequencies uh, later this week. But um, basically, what we made use of is the fact that in the raw reads, we expect um, different camers that belong to different chromosomes to have different frequencies. And so this is a 2D histogram comparing the frequency of camers in uh, the somatic library compared to the frequency of camers in the germ library on the, on the y-axis. And uh, so basically in this plot, um, the camers are sort of a higher frequency of camers are, is indicated with a, a more ye yellow color. Um, so you can see that there's sort of a cloud of camers that is associated with the autosomes at sort of a, um, that has a frequency of about 150 X in, in the somatic library. And then there's a, a camers that are associated with the X chromosome that are about half the frequency. So they're at about 75 X coverage. And then there's also some cameras that are entirely absent um, from the somatic sequencing library, but are present in the germ tissue library. And those are cameras that uh, are, are from the, the germline restricted chromosomes. So basically we took, we isolated the cameras based on um, their frequency in, in each library. And uh, so it basically said that any, any cameras, so for instance, the cameras in the green box belong to the autosomes, the cameras in the blue box belong to the X chromosome, and then the cameras in the, X, the orange box belong to the GRCs. And then we map those cameras back to the genome assembly. And then we needed to decide um, for each scaffold what, how we were gonna determine whether we were sort of confident that, this, uh, that the scaffold belonged to one chromosome type or the other. So in order to do this, we made this camera identification score in which we sort of calculated the proportion of map camers from the chromosome type with the majority of camers mapping to that scaffold divided by the scaffold length. And so that's what's shown in this histogram here. And um, so a few things you can see from this histogram is that, first of all, the, GR, the scaffolds that um, sort of are identified as belonging to the germline restricted chromosome seem to be bit easier to identify compared to the other chromosome types. So generally, uh, there are sort of a lot of cameras from the GRCs mapping back to those scaffolds. And it seems like it was pretty clear that the scaffolds belong to that chromosome type, whereas the other two chromosome types were slightly less clear. And generally, we found that longer scaffolds were quite a bit easier to identify than shorter scaffolds. And then lastly, you can see that there's sort of a range of uh, camera identification scores. Um, and so we needed to figure out when we were confident that this method had identified scaffolds as belonging to uh, the correct type of chromosome. So we had to make these cutoff scores. Uh, and so if the, if the identification score was greater than these cutoff scores, we were confident that the, this method had identified the scaffolds uh, correctly. So for the GRCs, we used a cutoff score of 0 0.8. And for the autosomes or X chromosomes, anything with a uh, identifications are greater than 0 0.4 we identified as belonging to those chromosome types. And I thought I'd just mention this as well because it's kind of an interesting side note. So we also um, tried this Kamer identification technique with the assembly that we made from the PAC bio data that we generated. And you can see from the Kamer identification scores that this didn't really work quite as well. And uh, the reason we think that maybe it didn't work as well is that this data was just a lot more error prone uh, compared to the Illumina data. So we think that maybe the cameras just didn't really map very well um, to these scaffolds. So uh, overall, what we ended up doing is that we only uh, identified scaffolds as belonging to one chromosome type or the other if both the methods that we used agreed on the identification. And um, so through this, the two methods, we are able to identify most of the genome to belong into either the autosomes, the X chromosomes, or the germline restricted chromosomes. And there is about uh, 20 megabases um, overall that we are unable to classify as belonging to any chromosome type. And it seemed like 
uh, for the most part, our unclassified scaffolds uh, were actually assigned as belonging to the same chromosome with both the coverage and CAMER methods that we use. Um, but they just didn't meet the CAMER cutoff score that scores that we set. set. Um, so we just weren't quite sure that they were assigned properly with the CAMER method. So uh, yeah, so through these methods, we were able to assign most of the scaffolds in the genome to belong into different chromosomes. And now after we've done this, we can look at how uh, the germline restricted chromosomes evolved in this species. So one thing you can see just from this table is that these chromosomes seem to be quite large and gene rich. So they make up about 40% of the genome, both in terms of their size and their gene number. But interestingly, you can see that also the size of the GRCs is about double what we would have expected based on uh, flow cytometry estimates for the size of one of these chromosomes. And so we think that that probably meant that the two germline restricted chromosomes in male germ cells were actually assembled separately in our, in our um, genome assembly. So one way that we tried to look at this in a bit more detail was we just plotted the uh, scaffold coverage of scaffolds that we had assigned to belonging to the GRCs. And you can see that there's a, a fair amount of range in the scaffold coverage for uh, scaffolds that belong to these chromosomes. And also you can see that there's sort of distinct peaks in this histogram. And since we expected that uh, the GRC scaffold coverage that we would get from the sequencing library was going to be at sort of at, at least 50X, this does sort of generally indicate that the two GRCs assembled separately because uh, generally the coverage for scaffolds that we identified as belonging to these chromosomes was about half of this amount. So this does open up questions about whether these two chromosomes are actually homologous to each other, because it seems like they're divergent enough on a sequence level to actually assemble separately in, in our genome assembly. And so the next thing we looked at to look at the evolution of the GRCs is we looked for homologs in our genome assembly. So we did an all by all blast of the annotated genes in the assembly. And from this, we basically wanted to understand whether the genes on the germline restricted chromosomes have homologs on other chromosomes in the genome, and uh, specifically whether there seemed to be a clear origin of the GRCs, so whether uh, GRC genes generally had homologs on one specific uh, chromosome in the genome. And so this bar, bar plot just shows the number of homologs that we identified in the genome and what chromosomes are involved in the homolog pairs. And what you can see uh, sort of right off the bat is that the GRCs have genes, have lots of homologs sort of um, on both the autosomes and the X chromosome. And also uh, in, our, in a collinear, collinearity analysis, um, it doesn't actually seem like the GRCs are, are uh, sort of derived from one specific chromosome in the genome because the, the, there's homologs sort of on all the other chromosomes in the genome. Um, so it seems like the GRCs aren't uh, homologous to one specific chromosome in the genome. And uh, so another thing you can see from this plot is that there's lots of homologs in which both gene copies were located on the GRC. And if we look at these, uh, a lot of these homologs are actually one of the gene copies are located on uh, scaffolds that have a coverage that would suggest that they're uh, on sort of different GRC chromosomes. Um, and so generally, this is again suggestive that although the two GRCs assembled separately in our genome assembly, they do share some homology. Um, but there also does seem to be some unique regions that uh, are quite different between the two GRC chromosomes. And so the last thing I'm going to talk about is how we use homologs to explore the origins of the GRCs. Um, so basically for this analysis, we made use of BUSCO genes. So this plot's just showing a summary of um, the, the BUSCO uh, gene assessment for our, this genome, our genome assembly. And you can see that there's lots of duplicated genes in our genome assembly. Um, and specifically, there's 340 duplicated BUSCOs that had one gene copy on the GRC and one gene copy somewhere else in the genome. So we made use of these BUSCO genes um, to determine the phylogenetic placement of the GRCs. So uh, we, we made a phylogeny with um, 
we sort of pulled out these busco genes and 14 other NAD genomes, and we made phylogenies out with these busco genes. And so we expected the placement of the GRC genes to give us some information about when they evolved. So just to remind you, uh, there are germline restricted chromosomes in the Sierra day clade, which is in teal, but there, there's also these chromosomes in the Cecidomia day clade, which is in purple. Um, and so we might expect that the GRCs uh, in the Sierra day evolved at the base of this lineage. And in that case, we would expect the GRC genes to sort of fall at, at the base of this lineage in our phylogenetic analysis. Uh, secondly, we might, have expect, we might expect that the GRCs evolved in the common ancestor of the Cecidomyidae and the Sieridae. And in that case, we would expect the GRC genes to fall at the base of both of these clades. So this is showing a concatenated phylogeny of uh, all, these, all the 340 busco genes. Um, and so what you can see here is that actually the GRC genes don't fall in either of the sort of places that we might have expected them to fall. Um, they're actually in the, the GRC genes are mostly or closely related to the cecidomide species and they actually fall within this clade. So the GRC uh, gene branch is this orange branch here. And so that's uh, really not what we expected to see. Uh, so we also looked at where the GRC genes fell in individual gene trees that uh, uh, went into these phylogenies. Um, and so what you can see is from this bar plot is that for the most part, the GRC genes uh, did fall within the cecidomide clade in phylogenies. And there's a, a smaller subset of genes that fell within the Sieridae clade. And then basically no other topologies were found. Uh, so this is generally sort of supportive of the idea that the GRCs evolved somehow from integration from the cecidomide clade uh, with sort of a, a subset of genes um, moving from other chromosomes in the Sierra Day genome uh, in, onto the GRC after they integrated into this lineage. So here's sort of a schematic of, of what we think potentially happened. Um, so we think potentially that the GRCs uh, evolved through hybridization between a Cecidomide and Sierra ancestor, in which the, uh, the genes that came into the Sierra line from the Cecidomide were then restricted to the germline and became the GRCs. So obviously, this idea is like a, a little bit controversial given the divergence level between these two families. Uh, so we would have expected that uh, this hybridization would have had to happen around like 30 million years after the split of these two families from each other. Um, yeah, so, so it's a bit of a controversial idea, but the, the data does seem to fit this idea overall. So right now we're, we're just looking into whether there's any other, other explanations for seeing this uh, pattern in our phylogenies. So for instance, a uh, long branch attraction. Uh, and if anyone has any ideas about how to look at this, uh, we'd be all ears. Yeah, so lastly, this is just sort of a summary of what we found. So the two GRCs do seem to be uh, quite big um, and quite gene rich. And it seems like, interestingly, they assembled separately from each other in our genome assembly, but there does seem to be some homologous regions between the two GRCs. And then lastly, it seems like they, they evolved in quite an interesting way. So it seems like potentially they evolved, oh, sorry, from hybridization followed by restriction uh, to the germline. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's all I have for today. If anybody has any questions, uh, yeah, I'd be all yours. Thank you, Christina, for your talk. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, I had a question if uh, those GRCs in the insects tend to be rich in transposable elements or gene arrays or duplications, uh, but also that question arose in me after the chimer segregation, the frequency plot, and then you mentioned the introgression, and then I, so I think it sort of explains why they are distant enough. <laughs> 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 
But uh, as for repeats, do, do they have also repeats, repetitive sequences? Yeah, so actually, um, we haven't looked into this in a lot of detail, but it seems like the general amount of repeat content is about similar to other chromosomes in the genome. So it doesn't seem like it's like unusually high or anything, but uh, we're- Another gonna... hand side, I guess that would be uh, like if there is indeed uh, 30 million years uh, distance between the two species, uh, I guess then also repeats would be quite unique to those uh, chromosomes, would not say. They would be more similar to the repeats that were present in the species that they are close to. Yeah, yeah, we would really like to have um, better sequence data for cecidomide species because uh, right now we have sequence data just from the like uh, autosomes and X chromosomes in that species. We don't have sequence data from the germline restricted chromosome. So uh, some of our analyses are a bit uh, restricted based because of that. So you're saying those uh, would come from the germline restricted chromosomes as well in that species, not necessarily the maybe autosomes that were sort of after hybridization events, like kicked into the uh, restricted yeah. mode. <laughs> Yeah, we really, I guess we just really don't know at the moment. I mean, I think that's a sort of a reasonable uh, hypothesis, I guess, but because we don't have any sequence from the germline restricted chromosomes in that lineage, it's really, it's really a bit hard to say. We have one more question in the chat. Uh, Sam, Sam, would you like to say it or should I read it aloud? One, two. No, I, I can say it, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I was thinking of, the, the, the phylogenetic tree placing the CRG uh, chromosome uh, somewhere else. I mean, it does look like it has very long branches. So I was wondering how that phylogenetic inference was, was done. Yeah, so the first tree that I showed was uh, a maximum likelihood phylogeny, um, basically with a concatenated alignment of all the BUSCO genes that we use in that analysis. Um, and so right now we're doing, we're trying to do a few things to try and figure out if it, there is like some long branch attraction. So one thing we're trying to do is just take out all the cecidamide species in, um, in the phylogenies and just see if the GRC genes still fall in the same place. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess if anybody has any good ideas about how to sort of rule out long branch attraction, that would be quite helpful. We're trying to figure it out, but it seems like, uh, it's a bit it's a bit of a tricky thing to do because we would expect that maybe the GRC genes would have sort of a relaxed sort of evolutionary constraint compared to other genes in the genome since because they did go through this transition to being only located in the genome or in the germline at some point. Yeah, well, that's a tricky problem in phylogenetics for everyone. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> there. but yeah. Yeah, it's not very easy, but um, but yeah, how many how many genes you have there? We have so we have been working with sort of all the Busco genes, um, but we mostly have been working with the there's sort of 340 Busco genes that have one copy on the GRC and then one copy on either the autosome or the X chromosome, mm -hmm. and so we've mostly been working with those ones. Um, so far, since I think those ones are sort of the most informative for us. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that was out of curiosity because I know nothing about gamers, but I'm working for genetics for, 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 so um, that's what triggered me <laughs> actually. So, yeah, thank you. I was also wondering then, it means probably that. Uh, method on uh, separating which scaffolds are uh, GRC originating or autosomal or somatic or germline, I guess then it would not work for the species uh, whose uh, GRCs are originating within their own species. They would not be different enough uh, by the chimere composition. So you hit a lucky spot, I guess then. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think it turned out to be really quite easy to use the, this uh, camera method to identify different scaffolds in the genome assembly to which chromosome they belong to. But I do think it could work if they were a bit more similar, but 
it, it was quite lucky for us that they happen to be so different from the rest of the chromosomes in the genome. Because I have not worked that much with schemers, uh, but it seemed from the intro uh, earlier that uh, usually it's the chimeras originating uh, from coding or non-coding regions that uh, sort of cluster together, closer uh, by frequencies and composition. And then I would guess that would make it much more trickier if it was same species. Yeah, I think if, well, I guess I think that maybe the sort of the plot that I showed with the camera identification scores, maybe that would have been, we would have had to sort of set different cutoffs if the sequence was more similar um, between the GRCs and the other chromosomes in the genome. But yeah, I, I mean, I think that's why we sort of use two different methods as well, right? Because if one of the methods didn't work particularly well, there's still sort of another method where you can classify scaffolds as belonging to different chromosomes.